We are very pleased to uh, be here today, and I want to thank the uh, whole organizers of this conference, uh, Derry Strong, for, for having us here, and for all of you for making the time to come and hear about the exciting project we have uh, at BC Organics in Greenleaf, Wisconsin. I am joined today by uh, a great panel of guests, so I will quickly introduce myself and then uh, tell you a little bit about them. Uh, my background is in chemical engineering uh, from the University of Michigan, and before that I studied uh, biology and biochemistry from Middlebury College. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, so I've started a few companies. Uh, this company, Digested Organics, got started about in 2013. Uh, we're based in Plymouth, Michigan, a little bit outside of Detroit, and we specialize in uh, providing advanced filtration solutions for a number of industries, including uh, the dairy industry, which we're here to talk about today. I'm also joined by uh, Carl Cray from Dynamic Renewables. Carl has over 20 years of experience throughout the construction industry, uh, wastewater as well as biogas, and his previous projects have ranged from uh, all the way from automating modest municipal pump stations to uh, developing and helping be part of the BC Organics project and other large projects uh, in excess of $60 million. So his specialty is in assisting with commissioning and startup and training of facilities uh, throughout the country and has also uh, provided uh, a lot of support in daily operations as well as uh, to the financial success of those plants. We're also joined by uh, Matt Garretts from Country Air Dairy. They're one of the participating farms in the project. Uh, Matt is a owner at Country Air Farms, which is a fourth generation dairy farm. He helps own and operate the farm along with uh, his uncle and dad, Tom and Mike Garretts, and uh, Jonathan Garretts, and two cousins, uh, Nicholas and Craig Garretts. Uh, together they own um, these two dairies in northwest Wisconsin and milk about 4,100 cows and operate 7,000 acres of cropland. And finally, uh, we're joined by Dan Weezy from the Weezy Brothers Farm, also a participant in the project. Uh, he's a co-owner of the farm, which is a third generation dairy farm in Greenleaf. Uh, along with his uncles and cousins, they milk about 6,000 cows and crop 7,000 acres of alfalfa, corn, and wheat. Dan's daily role on the farm includes project management, agronomy operations, and dairy maintenance. Dan worked closely throughout the development and planning stages of their partnership with BC Organics, uh, which is located just a mile from their farm. And he continues to oversee manure management uh, practices now and into the future, and uh, sees this digester project as playing a key component in that. So welcome to all of our panelists. We're going to start today uh, with a little bit of uh, background about uh, what we're going to be talking about for this hour. So we are going to start with a little bit of um, background on sustainability in the project and learn about what it took to really pull a project of this uh, size and scope together. Uh, so Carl will be talking to us a little bit about that. Uh, we'll then go through the actual technologies that are involved in the project, and I think this uh, does tail pretty nicely with what Terry was saying this morning in the keynote address about uh, really taking new risks and being innovative. This project has a lot of things that are very innovative, especially for the scale of the project uh, that, it, that it is. And then we'll uh, go to the farmers to tell us a little bit about the benefits they see about being a participant in the project, uh, as well as the, the benefits to the environment and uh, the communities that the project serves. So before I jump in, we have a little bit of an intro uh, video for you to kind of give you a sense of uh, what the project is all about and, and some uh, some pictures. The uh, I thought you know we are in the sustainability track, so I think um, a lot of different definitions of sustainability. I think one that fits well, especially for the dairy industry and for these uh, multi generational owned dairy farms, is this idea of being able to provide for the present while not uh, sacrificing or hindering the ability of future generations to do the same. And I think no one knows that better than dairy farmers, right? They're working the land, the water, uh, keeping the air clean, uh, you know, maintaining the health of their, their herd and their animals. And so I think that's a lot about what this project is about. The, the dairy farmers in this project, like I just said, are third and fourth generation farms. They've been there for decades. Uh, they understand what manure management means to the community, to the land, and uh, I think they're doing some pretty unique things in this project. So enjoy this video. It's just a couple minutes long and give you a sense of uh, what the project's about. We're at the BC Organics facility in Greenleaf, Wisconsin. To our knowledge, this is the largest project in the world that combines anaerobic digestion of dairy manure with an advanced filtration solution to reclaim that clean water and make concentrated nutrients. 
We have been working on this project for about over two years with our partnership with Dynamic and the goal was really to deliver a technology that could cut that manure volume in half for the farmers because to them that was a big component of why they chose to be involved in this project and support that kind of improvement in their watershed and on their farms. This process is about 900,000 gallons of manure per day. Of that, about 400,000 gallons be turned into clean, reusable water. On the renewable energy side of it, we produce about 1,630 MMBTUs of energy per day, which is roughly equivalent to about 11,000 gallons of diesel fuel every day. We also produce spedding, about 135 tons per day of that product gets created, and then we also have organic fertilizer products that are uh, sent back to the dairies for land application. So it initially started with doing a feasibility study. It then turned into a grant from the state of Wisconsin. That money allowed us to develop and then implement the renewable energy portion of the project as well as the clean water at the end of it, which is very unique at this scale for a project like this. So we've got 11 participating farms all uh, coming together in one location. We've got everything from the larger CAFOs, uh, multi-generational large farms, all the way down to uh, one of our participants has about 75 pallets. We did uh, an extensive period of pilot testing uh, with Dynamic, followed by then the actual engineering and uh, design process, and then fabricated the equipment in Michigan and, and shipped it here where that's being commissioned now. The feedback from farmers has been great. I think they are really appreciative of the effort that this project went through to install a system like this to help manage their nutrients and reduce their volume. Because as farms have gotten larger and larger, there's simply so much more manure to process. On average, a cow here in Wisconsin is making 30 gallons of manure every day. Manure is somewhere around 93% water. So anytime that we can reduce some of that water, uh, those are just loads of water that are going down the road with manure to a field for no reason. And uh, that will allow us to reduce the, the number of gallons that we have to apply on a field in order to meet the crop nutrient needs for the following year. We're applying a lot more manure than we'd like to, and we'd like to get, get down to that five to 6,000 gallons per acre um, throughout the summertime. We're talking with BC Organics that we could potentially get that 50 to 60 percent reduction in manure. That will obviously get more trucks off the road for us. When you're talking about the millions and millions of gallons that leave, if you can take away 10 percent, um, that's a tremendous amount of uh, trucks. We're excited about it um, as far as what it brings to the community, obviously. Um, less times we're in the field throughout the year, um, reducing phosphorus. Um, being in the area we are, we're in the Plum and Kankapot watersheds, so everything from here flows to the East River, and then to the East River, the Fox, and then into Lake Michigan. I think it's driven ultimately by consumer demand. And, and our dairy farmers produce great dairy products and, and their customers are wanting that to be more carbon neutral or negative and, and want their suppliers and they want to know that where they're getting their food from is doing the most they can to protect the environment and care for their animals and, and be good stewards. We believe that this is really the future of what digestion on dairy farms looks like uh, in this country and really globally as well. Uh, we're very proud to be part of that. All right, I hope you enjoyed that a little preview, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Carl, who will talk a little bit about how Dynamic uh, kind of started this project and uh, worked with the farms to pull it all together. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. The 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 it's better. You know, Bobby talked about uh, two years of of work that went into the to his portion of this project. And uh, Dynamic as the developer and now eventual owner and operator of the facility, we actually started this project back in 2017 um, and even a little bit prior to that. So, so as Dynamic as a developer, our goal and our role is to, to evaluate the, the opportunity both from the farmer's perspective and uh, all stakeholders. So BC Organics is a little unique. It initially got kicked off by Brown County as a feasibility study. Eventually, the state of Wisconsin liked uh, some of the findings of that feasibility study and the state of Wisconsin Public Service Commission and the DNR uh, put a grant opportunity out for an uh, inclusive type system. And their goals were to reduce volume and water that ultimately gets land applied, concentrating nutrients, take trucks off the roads, uh, produce renewable energy, and ultimately be cost effective. So, 
again, uh, as Bobby mentioned, there's a lot of words uh, of how sustainab sustainability is measured. And, and ultimately making money so that we can all do this long term uh, was, was the major goal. So in uh, 17, we received a grant from the state of Wisconsin to kind of continue with uh, the development of the project, uh, moved into engineering. And at that point, it's really uh, putting the, starting to put the pieces together. So stakeholders ranging from the, the dairy farmers, uh, from equipment vendors, from uh, local town and, and county officials, the DNR, and uh, really trying to put together those pieces to make a viable project, uh, both uh, engineering-wise and financially. So that happened in early 17, 18, and uh, into 19, 20, we uh, did all the engineering permitting, uh, found a location, ended up going to a second location after some uh, challenges in permitting. So uh, broke ground about a year and a half ago and are currently in the uh, startup commissioning phase. So we're, um, the digesters are full of manure, making gas, we're commissioning gas equipment today, and uh, the projects come along nicely. As we all know, anyone who's built anything in the last two years, getting equipment was about impossible. Uh, we re-engineered quite a bit to uh, meet the needs of what was available, and, uh, but we're in the startup process. So, so from Dynamics perspective, it's really putting the stakeholders together in a room uh, some of the most important ones are sitting here next to me, but there are nine other dairy farmers as well. And, and understanding what their needs are and, and how we can help meet them. So not every farm that we worked with or approached up in that area is a participant in the project. A uh, lot of dairy farms in that area, and, and as we bring manure in, we literally drive by some farms that aren't participating to go get someone else's manure. So the the goal of this project, like I said, was ultimately to reduce volume and clean water. Well, some farms valued that, that proposition and others didn't. They had what they felt were adequate systems. They didn't necessarily care about the renewable energy aspect of it, and, and that's fine. That's their, they can operate their project the way they want to. So we have uh, 11 total dairies, uh, two of which are represented here today with us, and uh, those, these two farms pipe directly from their farms to the digester. The other nine, we have a uh, manure route, just like uh, they currently have milk routes. So daily pickup, we have specific uh, paperwork, uh, bill of lading, all that kind of fun paperwork to go along with it. And uh, the goal for us is to hopefully long-term provide those farms with enough economic value that uh, they're able to help uh, maybe get some more value from their milk processor or maybe expand, milk a few more cows on the same amount of land save money manure hauling, and uh, some of the other benefits these guys can, can go into more detail of. So, so ultimately, it, uh, like I said, it's our goal to put those projects together. Digested Organics was the, the vendor that we're working with on the, the uh, manure treatment side of it, which is extremely unique for a project of this scale, and we're excited to really, really get it fine-tuned as well. We see the, the, the greater good of where this industry is going and some of the goals that need to be met on the waste side of it. And that's where the digester organics equipment comes into play. We, uh, I've personally been doing this for 15 or 20 years. So one of our goals is to continually get better at what we're doing, learn from our previous projects and do the next one better. And this is just the next step for us in terms of technology and sort of that next step of, of clean water and getting to what the the farm and the industry is demanding. Producing renewable gas and renewable energy pays all the bills, then that's off ultimately what, what pays for the entire facility. So the goal of producing renewable energy, and as we said in the, in the slide there of uh, bedding, we produce renewable energy, we produce bedding, we produce clean water, and uh, that's ultimately how we, how we pay for the project and keep things running every day. Yeah, I'll go into a little more detail here, but this kind of gives you a scale of the overall project. This is one of, if not the largest, biogas plant, certainly on manure in, in the United States, or maybe in the world for that matter. But the, uh, there's 16 anaerobic digesters. As we mentioned, we have 11 dairies participating, doing that 900,000 gallons a day. 
the, uh, everything happens at one centralized site. So this is the hub and spoke model that, that Bobby talked about. So this was a unique, unique location where there was a lot of farms in a small area and it made sense to uh, bring manure to one centralized facility. A lot of the other projects we work on are either a single dairy farm, which is significantly simpler, or maybe we bring together two or three remote farms to one central facility. Main reason for that is economies of scale, no different than, than milking you know, 2,000 cows instead of 200 cows. There's, there's great economies of scale in equipment, uh, construction costs, getting gas into a pipeline has an extremely high initial cost. So the more uh, BTUs or, or energy I can get into one connection, the better. So starting out the project, the uh, incoming manure, whether it's the pipes uh, from the, the two farms or the other nine farms, come into our receiving area. So the, there's an enclosed building. Everything is really done about being clean and, and professional. These are, um, you know, these are very, I'll say industrial facilities compared to maybe some of the more farmer uh, designed and built systems that have been around for 10 or 20 years. It's kind of a different, different level of expectations uh, operationally and uh, permit wise as well. So manure comes in, we have a couple of days storage there in the raw manure tanks where they get pumped into the digesters. There are 16 1.3 million gallon anaerobic digesters. So uh, kind of a, I think hopefully everyone in this room realizes today that digesters do not eliminate waste, right? We're turning the organics into the volatile organics into biogas, we're capturing that methane, right? We're not eliminating manure, I wish it would, but it doesn't. So that's where our further technologies actually uh, handle the equipment, or equipment handles that volume reduction. So what pays the bills is biogas production. So it's the actual creation of, of methane that eventually goes into the natural gas pipeline to be sold usually as vehicle fuel through the state of California. And then ultimately the renewable attributes, carbon credits, if you will, that go along with them. Biogas is captured in the, the flexible membrane roofs on top of the digesters and then processed through the uh, scrubbing equipment in the bottom left there. So post-digestion, after it's been in the tanks for about 21 days, we bring out that processed liquid, run it through screw presses. So typical start of the process is very typical to what a lot of farms do today to create bedding. Um, from there, it goes through the dryers. And site here we have two drum dryers that are creating bedding and that bedding goes back to the farms for their, their use. So that's another benefit to the farms is they have a steady uh, supply of bedding. Another big benefit for them that they can talk in more detail about. Great, thanks Carl. So after the screw presses, the liquid is still about three to four percent total solids or dry matter. Uh, you know, looks very much like uh, manure if you're familiar with that. And we go through a series of filtration steps to create clean, dischargeable water, as well as concentrated fertilizer products. And so, uh, I'm going to take you through a couple of those technologies uh, here. The first is uh, stainless steel ultrafiltration. So. Uh, the actual membrane itself looks like the tube in the bottom of the picture. It's about a three-quarter inch uh, pipe that, from the picture, you might just say looks like a, a stainless steel pipe, but actually it's porous, uh, and it's uh, coated in, internally uh, with a titanium oxide coating that uh, gives it some uh, performance characteristics. So the manure is actually flowing inside the pipe, and the liquid portion of it moves through the wall of the pipe. Uh, we call that the permeate or the filtrate. And some people call that tea water because it looks like tea. Uh, it's transparent. You could, uh, you could hold it up in front of a newspaper and read the newspaper through it. So it just has, a, has an amber uh, color to it, but it is totally transparent. And we've removed all of the suspended solids. Uh, we've removed the bacteria. Um, it's, a, it's essentially a sterile amber colored liquid that has all of the dissolved solids in it. Because this project is so big, we need a lot of that pipe. It's all about surface area. So every square foot of that pipe might be able to make, uh, let's say, 10 or 20 gallons a day of filtrate. We have to get through half a million or more gallons per day of filtrate. So we have a lot of pipe. Uh, we actually um, 
put those in vertical modules. So you can see those are 20 foot tall modules that if you looked inside have uh, thousands of these tubes in them that are each 20 feet long. So if you're familiar with like a shell and tube heat exchanger, that's sort of what it looks like, except the tubes are porous and the water goes through the wall of the tube um, and that's our filtrate. The material that doesn't go through the wall of the tube, we call that concentrate, and that's actually about 90% of the phosphorus and the organic nitrogen that was in that liquid. So what this first step is doing is it's concentrating phosphorus into about a quarter of the volume. So if we put 100 gallons into this process, about 25 come out with all of the, you know, 90 plus percent of the phosphorus that went in, and then uh, 75 gallons come out with almost no phosphorus in it. So because of the nature of uh, digested manure, almost all of the phosphorus is in these uh, suspended particles that this step removes. So this is uh, kind of a, a pre-filter to the reverse osmosis that we're about to do, but it's also a phosphorus and an organic nitrogen concentration step that makes a pretty unique um, high, uh, sort of high solids, high dry matter slurry. So still pumpable, but uh, much thicker, much more enriched in phosphorus. The next step in the process is something we call superfiltration, and this is very similar to the ultrafilter I just showed you, but it's a tighter membrane. So we got out all of the visibly suspended particles. It looks clear to the naked eye. Now we're going after smaller, uh, what's sort of called colloidal particles uh, that are around one kilodalton in size. So these are uh, microscopic uh, molecules and particles that would foul or kind of damage the reverse, osmo reverse osmosis membrane that's coming downstream. So again, this is another pre-filter. This is uh, a much more compact uh, type of filter because we can use spiral wound elements, which means we're taking sheets of membrane and we're wrapping them up into an, an element. And so we can pack a lot of surface area into a very small spot. Uh, if you're familiar with what reverse osmosis looks like at big commercial plants, these big white fiberglass vessels that hold the elements, that's what this looks like. It's just not a reverse osmosis element, it's a super filtration element. So this is a very unique technology uh, that is uh, particularly resistant to following. So the reason that filtration is so innovative and new with manure is because manure is very challenging to filter. It has a lot of uh, components in it like silica and organic matter and things like that that make it just very difficult to filter so your filter gets clogged and then you have trouble cleaning it and then you throw it out and then you're buying new filters and then the system makes no sense and it's not economical to run. What we've figured out is a way to make the system economical because the materials of the element itself are highly resistant to being fouled and getting dirty, so therefore they last a long time. They're very easy to clean, uh, and they allow us to, to run at a high throughput, which is what this plant needs. We have to make about 400,000 gallons per day of water from 900,000 gallons a day of uh, liquid manure. We don't have time to be down cleaning and uh, changing membranes every day, so this is a, a full-scale industrial type facility. The next process is reverse osmosis. Uh, we have a little bit of a unique uh, twist on that technology that we call subinduction time reverse osmosis, and that refers to, again, a, uh, a technology that is about how to use a standard uh, RO membrane, but do it in a way that resists following. Again, the, uh, that's always been the challenge in this industry is the, the membrane gets dirty, it's hard to clean, you throw the membrane out, and then it doesn't make sense. So we've invented a technology that allows us to uh, remove more water more efficiently from the filtered manure. Uh, so we get higher recovery, which is good. This project wants to make clean water and reduce those trucks on the road. So we wanna, we wanna use RO uh, as efficiently as possible to get as much water out. Uh, and so we do that with this uh, sequencing batch technology we've developed. Uh, the picture on the bottom is showing you the super filter permeate, which is that amber liquid on the left. The RO concentrates in the middle, so basically it looks like a, a dark black or dark amber uh, liquid, and then the clean water. And, and this step is where, so if you remember in the, in the stainless ultrafilter tube, we, we concentrated the phosphorus and the organic nitrogen. In this step, we're, we're concentrating the ammonia and the potassium. So basically that, that dark black liquid in the middle has essentially almost all of the ammonia and potassium of the project uh, of the stream it's processing there, and then the clean water is very clean. Uh, just has trace amounts of contaminants that sort of snuck through the membrane uh, due to its rejection characteristics. So uh, again, the, the ultra filter is concentrating phosphorus and organic nitrogen. This step is really con concentrating the dissolved ammonia and the potassium. The water coming out of that RO needs to meet a very stringent uh, NPDES discharge permit, and 
That permit requires very low levels of biological oxygen demand, which is a measure of organic matter, and very low levels of ammonia. So basically, we're putting it into a stream. We want that to be the cleanest water it can be to protect the community, aquatic life, all of those good things. So to do that, we actually go through um, a low-pressure polishing arrow and then a biofilter. So this is a, these towers are filled with little tiny pieces of plastic that look like little um, sort of T-shaped pieces of plastic or cross-shaped pieces, uh, pieces of plastic. Bugs are growing on those. Uh, those bugs are particularly targeted to uh, take that ammonia and convert it to nitrate and then to eat the organic matter uh, and, and convert that to um, essentially CO2. So uh, we oxygenate it, so we, we blow air into the, the water. So the water that leaves has gone through an RO basically two times, an aerated biofilter uh, to scrub any trace contaminants left. It gets aerated and then it goes through UV disinfection um, and through a sampler and out to uh, the stream or back to a tank that can pump back to the farms. And that's something that's also pretty unique. The project uh, can basically flip that valve whenever they want so they can send water to the stream and essentially it disappears. Uh, I think the value there is you didn't have to haul it in a tanker truck to get it somewhere else, so that is sort of a, an avoided cost. Uh, but we also think there's a great opportunity to send that water back to the farms and have them use it for irrigation, particularly in a dry season. Uh, if you can get a nice yield boost on your corn or, or whatnot, like you might as well irrigate that instead of just watch it flow down a, 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 a ditch in the side of the, the road, essentially. All right, so up next we have some slides about the benefits to the farmer. I want uh, you guys to have a chance to, to talk a little bit about that. And maybe, um, Matt, if you want to start a little bit on, on like how the, the concentration of the nutrients will help uh, keep trucks off the road and, and how you guys are going to handle that material, that'd be great. So what we're kind of planning on with the reduction in volume, obviously the further away you go from the farm, the more expensive it does get. So we're hoping those fields that are six, seven, eight miles, it becomes more economical for us to haul that nutrient to that field rather than uh, stay close to the dairies. Yeah, and Bobby, can you just kind of mention a little bit about, uh, we kind of can get two nutrient streams back. I want to talk about that for a second and it's kind of relating to this. Can you, can you kind of explain those two different nutrient streams and how that works? Yeah, sure. So uh, as I was mentioning, the Ultra filter concentrate stream is this thicker slurry. It has all the suspended solids, the phosphorus, and the organic nitrogen. And then the RO concentrate uh, is mainly the potassium and the ammonia nitrogen. And so the project can actually keep those separate um, as well as combine them. So the farmers have some flexibility to use those uh, kind of in a more targeted fashion. Yeah, so with multiple manure pits on the farm, you know, we're kind of really excited to, to kind of go into what Matt said is to take some of that land that's farther away um, that you know, when you don't have to, you know, sometimes it's cheaper to put commercial fertilizer on those fields, right? We'll keep the trucks close to the farm, uh, use the, the drag lines and stuff, but now having the ability to take that phosphorus and haul it farther away from the farm, cost effectively, and back at home where we've been using drag lines for a lot of years and maybe those, uh, those P numbers might be creeping up just a little bit, um, where we can use that, that uh, lower phosphorus, higher nitrogen, and meet the crop need for next year and be able to, you know, use those streams uh, very efficiently and, and agronomically. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously historically a lot of people are, uh, it's well, well known that manure is sort of not always the, the right balance of nutrients for different crops at different times of the, of the year and the season. And so the ability to so, sort of split those nutrients and concentrate them does give the farmers sort of a new set of uh, opportunities in terms of how they, how they plan their agronomy. And, and overall, I mean, I think uh, it's a lot of truckloads of manure, you know, that we're, that we're able to take off the road and that's something that um, I think you know, when you look at it on an annual scale of 24,000 truckloads has a tremendous impact to the, to the community. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about some of the, the benefits to the, the farmers kind of more in depth on application rates and things like that? So one of the things we're looking at, um, going more low disturbance on, uh, on manure toolbars, not having to overwork all of the land. Um, as far as um, the concentrate, obviously different times of the year, um, we would like to get at least 50% of our volume moved in the middle of summer mm -hmm. on a growing crop. Um, that's one of the goals of our dairy going forward. Yeah, um, so everybody knows that we have to do all this work in tighter and tighter windows, right? Everybody's experiencing that, you know, call it climate change, call it whatever you want, I don't care, but it's a, it's a tighter window, requires 
more equipment, and certainly when you're dealing with manure, tremendous uh, liability. And uh, I think if we can reduce volumes, uh, we can still meet the crop needs, but reduce volume with more concentrate, um, have better ways to apply it, like Matt said, to getting into the low disturbance. Um, you know, some of my no-till friends, you know, they give you a hard time because we work our manure, or work our ground in every year, right, so we can get manure applied, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're not, that's not the right thing to do. You're supposed to, supposed to be no-tilling, right? But, uh, you know, have, giving us some of the options and the opportunities to use some of those pieces of equipment and, uh, and, and eventually you know, increase yields as well as we go. Great. And then you guys want to speak a little bit to the benefits of the community about uh, what it'll mean to have fewer trucks on the road? Um, yeah, I, I think the community is huge, right? We've, we've talked for a long time. Uh, we put in underground pipelines and, and try to stretch out as far as we can. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I don't know anybody in our uh, town community that cares if there's a uh, orange, red, black hose uh, through the ditch. Um, doesn't seem to bother them a bit um, for that manure going out to the field, but if there's a truck that goes by their house every two and a half minutes, that does seem to be a, a bit of a nuisance. Um, so anytime that we can uh, reduce those trucks uh, uh, on the road, um, we can, you know, the roads are, are, are a failing infrastructure. It's not the farmer's fault, but yes, the roads in, in all the townships are are tough, they'll build a new road and then tell us we can't drive on it, right? Because they don't want it wrecked. Um, so anytime that we can uh, eliminate any of that stuff, I, I think is, is huge. And I think uh, the, the community is, is excited um, right now. And you know, I'm hoping that we can do everything we, we say we're gonna do. Yeah, I think you know, a couple of their points on that is that the, a lot of the accounting for uh, the value that these projects bring, especially on the gas side, is on uh, this basis of the carbon intensity. Right? So, right, so the projects get scored and that uh, attributes a value to the gas they produce. And the, uh, but these ancillary benefits, like the amount of diesel we're taking off the road from these trucks, the less exhaust that those communities are breathing in, and the related health effects that that has. I think there's a lot of sort of ancillary uh, community impacts that don't get tallied up in uh, the way that sort of this carbon accounting typically gets done. But, and these are things that it's hard to, uh, it's hard to put these on a spreadsheet and say, you know, it, how much is it worth that the neighbors don't complain about the trucks or the odor or uh, the roads getting torn up or the one time of the manure truck spilled out of 500 times that it went down the road, right? So those are hard things to monetize, but I think they're very real. And uh, what I heard when I went to some of the, um, like the permitting town halls and things that happen to get this project off the ground is that that's what the people who live in those communities care a lot about. Uh, and so I think that's just an important aspect about when you, when you do a big project like this and you sort of decide where, where it needs to go, it's, you know, a lot of it is driven by the economics of how many cows are in a, maybe a 20 mile radius and where is the gas connection point and all of that. But these are communities that have had these dairies there for generations and the ability to continue to be there is, is really predicated on this kind of innovation. Um, otherwise, the farmers you know, might consider e relocating. You know, those communities have efforts to you know, try to curtail some of their activity. So I think this is a real step that says these farmers and this developer chose to do this uh, because it was the right thing to do for the community, not because it made the project more money uh, or not because there was some other kind of scheme. So I think that, that's an important aspect of kind of what's what's going on at this project that we hope is the model for other, other projects. I think the industry needs to see that the value in volume reduction is real and the farmers want that and they know that that's important for their, for their communities. So we just have two more slides here. I wanna talk a little bit more about fertilizer. It's a, it's a really common topic that we hear a lot of folks interested in. So the two streams that we talked about, this ultra filter concentrate and the RO concentrate, are in themselves, we consider those liquid fertilizers, right? So they're organic certified. They don't have any chemical additives. Um, and they are concentrated more than manure is, right? So maybe the levels of phosphorus in the UF concentrate are four or five times higher than in raw manure. Uh, and the ammonia levels, uh, likewise, in the RO concentrate, four to five times higher. So there is already a concentration, right? Maybe before these guys were putting 15 to 18,000 gallons of manure on an acre, now they can put maybe 5,000 gallons of concentrates on an acre. So that's a substantial uh, concentration factor. But it's not enough for us to sell that somewhere else, right? Like we're not gonna ship UF concentrate out of the state or even maybe 50 or 100 miles, right? It's, it's concentrated, but it's not concentrated enough. So 
We have other technologies that we bolt onto the back of these facilities that then produce a sellable, uh, much more transportable concentrate, and typically that's around uh, two nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. So the first here is a, a nitrogen product uh, that is anywhere from four to let's say 8% nitrogen uh, that's organic approved. And so uh, we tend to work with conventional dairy farms that are not organic themselves, but that fertilizer concentrate can be sold to an organic grower and has a lot more value to that grower as a pound of nitrogen than it does to these farmers who use conventional uh, fertilizers. And so there's a unique aspect here where we can take uh, conventional manure that's been digested, filtered, concentrated, and sell that as an organic fertilizer to the growing organic market uh, where it has a value that's easily five to sometimes even 10 times more valuable per pound of nitrogen than a conventional source of nitrogen, even though nitrogen fertilizer prices are so high right now as it is. Um, but so this is an interesting way to add additional value to projects and help farmers get a new value stream uh, because in some cases they either maybe don't want the nitrogen or they don't have as much use for it um, or there's other ways that we can sort of compensate them for that while making this organic fertilizer. So that's something that we're working um, hard on right now in a few projects that I think is again another way to layer uh, another innovative technology here. And then uh, the next is a product that we call TerraChar, which is a biochar uh, product that is made from the solids. So uh, there's sort of two sources of this. One would be that fiber that uh, Carl was talking about that comes off the dryer. Ideally, that goes to cows for bedding, but in some situations there might be excess of that, and that is a great cellulosic material that we can turn into biochar. And biochar, uh, for those of you who don't know, we basically take the fiber and you're heating it up to very high temperatures in the absence of oxygen. It's a process called pyrolysis, and what it does is it locks all the carbon into uh, what looks like charcoal, essentially, uh, in a way that that carbon is never gonna come back out. So the reason it's valuable from a carbon uh, perspective is that people are valuing it for its, uh, its carbon credits, its carbon intensity, because that fiber uh, had plant material in it that could have sort of degraded somewhere over time and entered back into like today's uh, sort of carbon cycle. When we turn it into biochar, it basically cannot. Uh, like it's, it's so locked up uh, that that carbon is never gonna go back into the atmosphere and therefore it's valuable. Like people are willing to buy that attribute because you've taken carbon and you've locked it into this black char and it's never coming out. Uh, and then besides for that, it's also just a really nice agronomic additive. So it, it helps uh, retain moisture in soils. It can uh, provide us a, a source for microbes to grow and like it's, it's actually proven to be very useful if you apply like a ton per acre as a, a soil amendment. So this is a, another add-on technology that we're looking at at this project and others to, again, derive more value for the, for the project and the farmers out of a resource that they already have, as well as produce a new co-product that uh, can add a lot, of, um, a lot of benefits to the project. So two, two kind of innovative, uh, interesting things that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, with that, uh, that is sort of the end of our formal presentation, but I think we would love to take some questions and answers before lunch here. So I open the floor to that. Yeah, go ahead. So to simplify things, I know these guys are piping it in, but the guy that's hauling it in, how much gets returned to the farm on a percentage basis? And what if they only have one big lagoon? Obviously the, the two products you're getting. Um, explain that a little bit. Sure, so so roughly uh, half, of, half of the original volume is returned to the farm in total gallons. And then uh, you're right, some farms have, have one lagoon as opposed to multiple. We have several of our participants that, that own chunks of land in various locations, right, further away from the farm. So several of them are actually looking at, at locating a storage, a new storage at those remote locations to allow them to get those nutrients as, as uh, Matt was saying, the phosphorus especially, over to those fields where they need it that have only had commercial fertilizer, for example. So, so that's one route where it gets, in that, in that case, it gets delivered directly to that, that end location, which is good for them. Uh, the ones that only have one storage to dump it into, ultimately you're combining those two nutrient streams into one, so you, you do lack that benefit of the, of the phosphorus versus the nitrogen availability or, or potassium. So, but the nutrients ultimately get combined back together and, and end up more, uh, I'll say, manure-like. 
uh, for land application at that point. Just half the water removed. Yeah, go ahead. Are you bringing in the solid manure or is there farms that's bringing in liquid manure? Are you able to take all manure? Everything that's coming in is getting, has to be pumpable. So as long as they can get whatever that manure stream is into a slurry and onto a truck, we're handling it. But not specifically like uh, manure spreader manure, no. Yeah, go ahead and back. Has there been any thought about uh, further reducing the solids so you can pelletize it and just remove the liquid altogether? You're talking about the solids off the screw press or the... Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we, you know, let's use raw numbers and say we've gotten half the liquid uh, out as clean water that we can irrigate or discharge, and then the other half are these concentrates. And I think the question is, why can't we just go all the way to, you know, 99% water and 1% dry, you know, uh, granulated or pelletized fertilizer? That's totally doable. We have projects where we use evaporators and other tools to go past where membranes can go. This project takes membranes as far as anyone has ever taken membranes and then it stops. But there are add-on technologies that can then go further. Usually it's, it's thermal. So we've used, we've used membranes and pumps to push as much water as we can out with pressure. And now membranes are done and you go to using natural gas and thermal means to evaporate water. Um, so we do do that for projects. Usually it's because uh, the salt content or something about those liquid concentrates really drives the farmer to say, I need those condensed and out of here. Um, that wasn't really a driver for this project and it's also a lot more expensive. So. Uh, it's kind of that classic situation of removing the first, you know, 20% of the water is really easy, the next 30% of the water is a little bit harder, and then the next, you know, 30% of the water is very, very expensive, like exponentially more so. So we sort of stopped at the point where it provided the best value for the farmers and for the project without going, without going past that. But I can add to that one too, just as from our standpoint, um, you're looking at storage then, tremendous amounts of dry storage to then land apply something like that versus now we're just using the existing infrastructure that we already have uh, in, in lagoons and manure pits and things like that and uh, being able to land apply that. Yeah. One of our biggest things when this whole deal, I think that really got us excited was the fact that we weren't gonna lose our nutrient stream, right? This whole thing could happen and then we would get those nutrients back because I, I don't wanna go buy commercial fertilizer to, for 7,000 acres, I would much rather uh, you know, put on the nutrients that we have and be able to still work with the neighbors and buy their corn and, and uh, put the nutrients back on their field as they would like as well. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a great point about the handling. I think some farms uh, are set up for solids handling. Like, they, you know, they want, let's say, a pile of cake or um, and you're, you're gonna use a front end loader and put it in a spreader, all that. And some people say, I'd rather stop, you know, at let's say 10% solid slurry that's totally pumpable than go to a 20% solid cake that I have to handle as a solid. And if you, if you were going 200 miles, you'd probably go to a cake and try to get it on a truck. You know, like that is a consideration. But I think that was a, for this project, kind of keeping everything pumpable and in and out of tankers. We're kind of going right to the level where it's just before it's not pumpable anymore. And that was sort of the best for this project, just with the infrastructure that everyone has. But that's a good point to kind of back to, to his initial question about multiple storages and some have them and some don't. I know there's some projects that didn't participate because they didn't have the right type of storage on their farm. So there's a lot of those types of challenges that come along the way of development and evaluation from our perspective and the farm's perspective to, to make sure we have the right fit for them. Right, Whether I think there's... As a solid, bedding storage is another option. Uh, some farms have storage for bedding on site, others don't, so they need it daily. You know, all those types of, th th this facility is about logistics. Um, the volume, moving it through the facility, getting it out of the facility, back to the farms, and ultimately onto the land, it's, a, it's all about logistics. Right, and I think we, you know, it has been a project that's gone on for years, and so there's been lots of thought of, well, if we have this now, what could we add on later? And so I think we've hopefully been smart about designing it for, oh yeah, we do want to put on that biochar plant. Okay, we do want to add on a, an evapor, you know, so the, those options are, those doors are still open for us, I guess, uh, and we'll kind of see as time goes what's, uh, what's most interesting. Yeah, I think what gets me excited as, as the developer is seeing what companies like, like Bobby and, and others are doing out in this industry right now. And I mean, it's really just kind of coming to 
to uh, some fruition here on projects where a lot of these new technologies are, are being proven and, and uh, some of that has come certainly at some hard lessons by some of our predecessors who have learned things the hard way. Um, and, and that's how, as an industry, we all get better, right? We all, we all learn from our mistakes, we all get better, we, we try something different, we keep learning and moving forward. So that, uh, I mean, looking at the next step, as Bobby said, uh, talking about biochar four years or five years ago when this project got started, I, I knew what it was, but I never considered it as a viable, uh, viable option where today it is, you know, and that's just in five, six, seven years. So um, that's what yeah, kind of excited ahead. to me. I'm going to take that, Carl. You want me to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, it's no great secret. Um, you know, everybody has, has negotiated their own contracts. Um, but uh, as far as I know, there are no checks being written out to the farms. Um, so the gas uh, is, is property of dynamic. Um, the financial benefits that come in to the farms and, and for guys like us is that volume reduction. And that was, you know, right from the beginning, that was what we were going for, right? The, the volume reduction is the beginning of opening up a lot of doors. Uh, you know, you take uh, all those trucks, 50% of your manure, put that in a truck, figure out what it takes you to your average distance to your field, times whatever hour you're paying for your truck, and I'm pretty sure you're gonna pay a few dollars more next year than you did this year, and so on and so on. Um, you know, those financial benefits uh, seem to be you know, fairly exponential once this all works. Yeah, every project we work on is, is different. This is a very unique one with the water treatment. Right now in the biogas industry, some farms are, are paid for their manure, they're paid on a, a profit share type of arrangement for the biogas. There's, there's a lot of different models out there, so they really vary, but uh, as I mentioned, this project had some very specific uh, goals and desires, both from the farms and, and all stakeholders, the community, the, the DNR, things like that. So. So it's very unique, and every, every, every project's individual. We look at them as, as an individual site and farm, and that's how we go about them during the development project process. Did you have a question? Me? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have two quick questions. One, do the dairies have any ownership in this, or is it completely like, you know, you guys that own it? And then the, the second question is, do you have to take the nutrients back that you sent there, or you know, if, if I like, Dynamic Renewables owns the facility the, and operates it. The uh, farms get back the same percentage of, of nutrients that they supplied. Today, um, we're, we're trying to keep it simple. I fully envision long term the way these guys think. There's going to be plenty of horse trading, I think, going on when it comes to nutrients and who's applying what on what fields and, and working together. We've seen that on other projects where, um, you know, instead of driving by, one field to get to the next one to apply my manure maybe we're working together to put all one product on and and some of that creativity that i'm sure will happen but contractually isn't required yeah i'd say that to that there's already been beers uh drank and conversations uh with the neighbors and uh how we are going to get our manure truck to a field farther away than pump out of the neighbor's pit and uh at carl's expense so that's definitely <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're doing that is there a question over here? Yeah, go ahead. Did you, um, as far as the DNR manure permitting or the co-mingling, and the, was, was they in favor of it or not in favor of it? Or? That, so what, that's a good question. One reason this project exists is because the DNR was in extreme favor of it. They were uh, both financially and, and from the top down, and originally from the governor all the way down through, through the DNR and even through the local people. I will say um, they were great to deal with, and, and they, they wanted to see this project figured out and, and happen. They were our proponent, um, which, which was nice to actually say that. Um, I've worked in a lot of other states and other projects where that was not the case. So um, they want to see solutions. To, to manure and volumes and, and nutrients. Some of these technologies that we're doing here are part of it. Um, one of the goals is to 
to show that these types of systems can operate effectively and, and ultimately cost effectively at this scale, right? I, I don't think it's a secret that dairy farming is, not, dairy farms are not getting smaller. The manure volumes are not getting smaller. Um, they're not gonna feed their cows less and get less milk, I don't think. So, um, you know, to help achieve some of those, those challenges or, or offset some of those challenges, I think the DNR sees this as a, as a potential solution. So not that it's the solution, but it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. So they were, they were very supportive and, and good to work with. This does have a, a discharge permit for the water, one of just a, a handful in the state. So that certainly had its challenges to, to get to that point. Um, it's extremely stringent. The, um, the other aspect of it was uh, co-mingling manure that you asked about. So uh, we, we as Dynamic have done several multi-farm projects where we've co-mingled manure and, and we've kind of learned the ins and outs of how, the, how to do that properly permit wise. Um, ultimately it is their, theirs to land apply at the end of the day. Uh, but our permit takes it in between, essentially. So we have our own, the site has its own permit separate from the farm. So that, uh, that's something we worked with over the DNR actually on several projects to, to iron out the details on and, and uh, Wisconsin did, did get there, get it figured out with us, so. They have been very inquisitive, the DNR all the way from top to bottom. Um, it's, as far as permitting for us, they're not changing anything. Um, we still need to maintain that 180 days of storage going forward. None of that's going to change, um, but that's just something they're going to keep an eye on going forward. I think the previous question where you talked about, where I had joked about, you know, trading horse trading manure back and forth and stuff. Yeah, as funny as that sounds, it's actually significantly easier. Right now you do a CAFO to CAFO transfer, right? It's all about, I need a, I need a test per thousand gallons of my manure, your manure, we gotta figure out how that all worked out in the eyes of the DNR. If you're working with another permit, uh, permitted farm or a participating farm in this, that manure concentrate is very similar, right? So it's very, very easy in their eyes to say, oh, well, a million gallons of yours and a million gallons, of that one is the same. So it's very easy to trade on paper and we can move things around and be, be extremely efficient. So they're, they're telling us it should be no problem. Do you have a question? Um, how does the bedding aspect work? Do farms need to have storage for that? And are all the farms utilize, will all the farms utilize the bedding? Yeah, some of the farms are on bedding or on uh, sand bedding currently. Uh, most, if not all of them, will be switching over long term is the, is the plan of attack. We have some storage on site. Some farms want to have their own. They already have a box truck and things like that. They'll haul their own. Um, we have some third party trucking that'll haul forward as well. But, uh, and then if we have additional extra left over that's not used as bedding, which I don't think is going to be a problem, uh, we do have a horticultural buyer that'll take any, any leftover. But uh, we're seeing from the bedding perspective, we're seeing a real, a real growing trend of, of the fiber, especially good quality dried fiber being in, in very high demand actually. So I think we'll have no problem getting rid of any, anything we produce. We're planning on making the switch from sand to, to dried fiber. Uh, obviously gonna be a learning curve there, but we're planning on making that switch. And you already do. Yeah, we're already on fiber. Yeah. Uh, sounds like a great project. Uh, just going back to the manure treatment and the water reclamation, what are you looking at for like capital requirements for a system like that for the project we're speaking about here today? Yeah, so every, every project's unique in terms of the size and kind of what, what scope, uh, you know, how clean the water needs to be depending on a discharge permit or if it's gonna be irrigated or fed to cows and things like that. So uh, I don't wanna put a, a specific price tag on it, but it is pretty easy to uh, have a project come to us and say, hey, I've got 100,000 gallons, you know, per day of this. I want it turned into clean water or just tea water or that, and, and it's easy for us to, to get, you know, budgetary estimates to folks pretty quick. So we work with developers all the time to to do that. Yeah, go ahead. So we haven't done a lot of specific bioavailability work, uh, kind of under the understanding that it's basically just manure but with water removed. So I think uh, it'll kind of handle and uh, be used by the farmers and you know, they'll, they'll realize it's more concentrated and apply it appropriately but um, we haven't done any more detailed studies on, on its bioavailability relative to just conventional manure application, I guess. 
We, we did a little bit on uh, digested manure, and this is still digested manure, now just less water in it. So I assume some of that. And that was UW-Madison, uh, uh, well, that's probably five, six, seven years ago. Kerry Lebowski did that study. So um, on the digested manure side of it, yeah, there's been some work done, but there'll be a lot more done. And, and ultimately, I'm sure we'll have plenty of feedback from our participants on uh, how new and I will are say it's a great opportunity for, if there's folks in the audience who are uh, you're from a university or something, or you know, I, I think this is a project that is very open to that kind of collaboration. If someone said, I want a tote of UF concentrate to go study how it grows something compared to conventional fertilizer, like we'd love to talk to you about that. So we're very open to uh, collaboration in that regard. Yeah, did you have a question? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the technology is very scalable. You know, there are certainly economies of scale. I would say a thousand cows is probably roughly a minimum um, where you'd want to go through the entire process. But uh, certain parts of the technology, like if you just wanted tea water, for example, if you had a phosphorus issue and wanted to concentrate phosphorus, that's economical down to smaller scales. But uh, yeah, if we're doing the, the entire thing, getting the water discharge permit, all of that, it, we're typically working with, with the 3,000 and up size operations. Yeah, from, from, and from our perspective, as we're developing a biogas project, uh, generally without the water treatment aspect of it, we like to see two to 3,000 cows, preferably five to 10. When we start looking at technology like this, you need closer to the 10 to start to pencil out some of the economics, generally. Go ahead. Um, has there been any consideration for doing a cooperative effort uh, where you could reduce the transportation by mixing cotton manure and manure with you know, something dairy so that you can have less transportation costs by depending on the wider different kinds of livestock? Yeah, I don't know, Carl, do you look at different kinds we, of livestock? We inputs? have done projects where it's a combination of like hog and steer, for example. And physically, it'll digest, it'll make gas, that's not a problem, and, and you're right. The, so the nice thing about a digester, um, from, from a treatment perspective, when you add on these additional equi uh, equipment, it's a giant homogenizer, right? You have a 1.3 million gallon mixing tank. So, so that's a huge benefit to any downstream technology that you're, you're bolting onto it, regardless of what it is. So that part of it's good. The, the, uh, challenge right now is with some of the the way the gas sales and the carbon market is set up it's hard to combine non-manure with other manures or non-cow manure with other manures and some of the paperwork side of it physically no problem it's more of accounting challenges at this time i think we have time for one more question before lunch or no more questions before lunch here we go. You mentioned lunch <laughs> Good so one of the one of the challenges with this project uh, during the permitting process is is the local town did not they, they wanted the project to happen they wanted it to support the local farms that were there they did not leave a lot of room for expanding it in the future there is a little room for some of the existing farms to um, to grow a little bit which we anticipate but. Uh, Nothing, nothing substantial, unfortunately. If I could ma wave a magic wand, yeah, I would have given myself unlimited space and, and opportunities, but uh, permitting-wise, that wasn't uh, a good option for them. All right, well, I think we'll end there. Thanks, everybody's time, and for joining us, and uh, go enjoy lunch.